Okay, I think it is 2 p.m. So, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you, and also good morning to our friends in Canada and the U.S. My name is Doris Carson, and I'm going to moderate this panel session this afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to day three of this year's Arctic Futures Symposium. So, our first panel session this afternoon is going to discuss how we can encourage a better environment for a uniquely Arctic entrepreneurship and investment culture. And um, the focus is particularly on local entrepreneurship in small Arctic communities, you know, as opposed to the larger urban centers and maybe the more investment intensive resource hotspots. Uh, I think we also want to discuss a little bit about how we can better harness local traditional knowledge in combination with new ideas and external scientific research on important issues like climate change, for example, and how we can use this to stimulate a local business development culture and, and the investment culture in local communities. We have four very interesting and exciting guest speakers lined up for you today. They come from very different corners of the Arctic, including from Canada, Greenland, Denmark and Norway. And um, yeah, yeah, each of them, them comes from, from a very, very different, different background as well. So they will be able to provide very different perspectives on entrepreneurship and investment opportunities in the Arctic. We have here with us today Trevor Bell from Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada. We have Emil Shervedal from the municipality Commune Karfig Sermesok in Greenland. We have Christian Wintergaard from the Danish Foundation for Entrepreneurship. And last but certainly not least, we have Tor Erik Zombi, a business entrepreneur who lives and works in a small Arctic community in northern Norway. Um, the aim for this panel was to get a diverse range of insights and not just from different geographic locations, but also from different stakeholder perspectives. And I think this is really, really important if we, we want to understand how economic systems operate in remote Arctic environments and also in terms of how can we improve stakeholder interactions and knowledge exchange across various scales, local, regional, national, um, external, like even international scales? We have um, approximately one hour for this panel. And the plan is that every speaker will first give a short presentation of up to eight minutes, I would say. And then we will have a plenary discussion at the end to address some of the burning questions. Um, like to maybe just give a little reminder to the audience at home. You are most welcome to join us and join in and participate in the discussion. If you're using the WebEx application, uh, you can send in your questions via the Q&A function. And this is in the, uh, the lower right corner of the screen. So to open it, you just click on the little sideways arrow next to where it says Q&A. And this should open a dialog box where you can type in your question for the panel. And for those of you watching us on the IPF YouTube channel, you can send your question by email to events at polarfoundation.org. And we'll then get forwarded to us on the panel. Um, yeah, we will do, of course, our best to address your questions. But if we get too many and we, if we run out of time, so please forgive us if we can't answer all of them. But if you would like to continue the discussion after the panel session, that's also possible. You're welcome to do so on the Slack space. And that has been set up for the symposium. The link for the Slack space should be in the invitation that was sent to you by email to join the webinar today. And I believe uh, it will also be posted again shortly in the Q&A section. Right, um, before we get started with our first speaker, let me just briefly introduce myself as well and my connection to this panel topic. As I said, my name is Doris Carson. I'm a researcher and a lecturer in geography at Umeå University in northern Sweden. And I'm also an affiliated researcher with uh, the Arctic Research Center, ARCUM, at Umeå University, which is a kind of a major coordination and collaboration platform for Arctic research in Sweden with over 300 affiliated researchers. And my personal background is in social and economic geography, and I'm specifically interested in the intersection of tourism, 
migration and new economic development in small and remote villages in the north. And I live myself in a, in a very small and isolated village of just about 100 residents. And it's, it's a village that has long been struggling with issues of economic decline, out-migration, loss of local services, and so on, you name it. But I would say in recent years, we have seen an increasing international interest in this otherwise declining rural inland area. And this is both from a tourism point of view, also from a migration point of view. We have seen a lot of international migrants, like myself even, who have moved here from countries like Germany, the Netherlands, and other countries, mostly in Central Europe, um, because they are looking for typical Arctic experiences and place amenities. They want to have access to the northern wilderness. They're looking for long winters with lots of snow and exotic activities like dog sledding and snowmobiling and so on. And a lot of these migrants have come here and they have started up small tourism companies in the middle of nowhere. And they are promoting these Arctic experiences as new commercial tourism products. They're also bringing in a lot more uh, international tourists from their home country. So it's truly becoming more international. And I think it's kind of interesting to see how more and more local businesses and local people are also starting to realize and to discover and to appreciate that the Arctic and its assets for things like place branding and destination marketing and product development are becoming um, more interesting and more important. And this hasn't really been the case in the past. In the past, a lot of the locals around here didn't really think of themselves as being in the Arctic or, or they didn't say that the Arctic could be something exotic and something attractive to somebody from outside and that this could maybe even be a business opportunity. So. We're definitely seeing some kind of change in mindset here in northern Sweden and the change towards more Arctic branded businesses and tourism destinations. One area of my research has looked at network dynamics and knowledge exchange between these new migrant entrepreneurs who come here, and the local entrepreneurs and the local organizations that are already here. And this isn't always as straightforward, I must say. And I mean, we all know that new knowledge and new ideas coming in from outside are often good to trigger new local innovations. But I think at the same time, we shouldn't assume that this knowledge transfer will happen automatically and, and, and that local people are just sitting there and waiting to soak up all that new knowledge as soon as it becomes available. As in, I think it's particularly important for us external stakeholders coming from the research sector, also from the government sector, we need to be more aware of local cultures and traditional knowledge, local practices and values. And I think we need to think of new creative ways how we can make our external knowledge available to local stakeholders in, in a way that also respects their ways of life and their local knowledge systems. And I think this brings me um, now to our first speaker. I would like to hand over to Trevor Bell. He will be sharing with us some experiences from his work with indigenous communities in Northern Canada. Trevor is a geographer and a research professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And his work focuses on climate change adaptations in Inuit communities. He has twice received the Arctic Inspiration Prize for knowledge to action plans that benefit Arctic peoples. And his most recent partnership project, Smart Ice, which I think he's going to talk about, has transformed into a social enterprise recognized by the United Nations for its novel climate solution. So thanks for joining us today, Trevor. I'll hand over to you now. You may share your screen and the virtual floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, my tr presentation today is going to focus on uh, a social enterprise and the emphasis on how social enterprise can foster entrepreneurship and the geographic focus is um, Canadian coastal Arctic communities. And these are all Inuit communities. So it's uh, on my slide here, I'm showing you essentially the homeland of Inuit in Canada, which is referred to as Inuit Nunangat. These 50 or so communities are small, 
isolated remote communities. There's a total population of about 55,000 people, and you're looking at a distance of about 4,000 kilometers, so essentially from Ireland to Turkey. So this geographic context has real implications for business um, and entrepreneurship and running social enterprises in the north. A couple of these things come to mind. Obviously, the high cost of doing business in these small remote communities. You've got the cost of rent, energy, importing goods and materials. Also, the lack of digital infrastructure. There's only 40% of Indigenous-owned businesses report no internet connection. 40% no internet connection or a non-reliable one. So in this modern era, that's very difficult to support local businesses. Of course, the sparse population means that there's very little local markets and the cost of shipping goods means it's um, cost prohibitive almost to send products out from these small communities. Although I'll show you through Smart Ice, we are doing that. Um, also, Inuit communities experience a lot of systemic barriers to work. These include, of course, high rates of trauma, substance abuse, food insecurity, other social challenges. And really, there's limited inf infrastructure and only basic services in place to address these barriers. Other barriers to work include inadequate access to childhood, lack of affordable housing and mental health challenges. However, I believe that social enterprise is a preferred business model for running this type of entrepreneurship businesses in communities. I'm going to hopefully uh, demonstrate that to you and then illustrate it using Smart Ice. Smart Ice is a, a work integration social enterprise that empowers Indigenous communities across Inuit Nuningat to travel safer on ice. So what is a social enter enterprise? It's essentially to achieve a public good through a business practice. So it's directing business efforts towards some sort of a social, cultural or environmental purpose. So one of the key points about this is it addresses local priorities. Here, one of our Smart Ice employees living almost at the northern end of Inuit Nuningat in Pond Inlet on Baffin Island, he, is, he constantly reminds me, traveling on the sea ice, and remember that the ocean is frozen off Pond Inlet for more than nine months of the year, traveling on sea ice is essential to Inuit maintaining their way of life. It's part of their culture and identity, not just a hunting platform or travel highway. So it's really important that uh, social enterprises address these local priorities, for, such as food security, traditional crafts, and in this case, uh, travel safety. But also that social purpose and mission, and especially when we think of the inequity across Inuit Nuningat and between Inuit communities in Northern Canada and in the South. And these sorts of uh, numbers here, these statistics, give you a sense of what that inequality is. And so, Whatever you're doing in Inuit Nuningat, trying to address this social inequality should be a primary uh, mission, including running a business. So, um, in, the, in the context of Smart Ice, it's also important that social enterprises uh, adhere to Inuit societal values. And that's why a social enterprise is well aligned with uh, Inuit communities because of these societal values like caring for the environment and the community and being innovative and resourceful. What I'd like to do next is just show you a short video around Smart Ice and then um, we'll come back to the presentation. Smart Ice is a community oriented social enterprise offering a climate change adaptation tool. As climate change intensifies, this results in more dangerous and unpredictable over-ice travel for northern communities. A 2010 survey found that 1 in 12 people had fallen through the ice during a previous warm winter. And so if they don't feel safe on the ice, that means that their access to country food, so hunting and fishing, 
are diminished and their access to, you know, go for work or to, uh, uh, to practice cultural activities. Through Smart Ice technology, sensors record sea ice measurements along these travel routes and other areas chosen by the community. The data is then distributed back to the community to inform them about the safety of these routes. So it's, it's really about helping them adapt and um, make informed decisions. So that's what we do, but we're a social enterprise and we're a work integrated social enterprise. And we offer the opportunity for youth, Inuit youth, to make our technology. We train them in a lot of things. Uh, we help them with their resumes, cover letters, um, some financial literacy um, that are great for other employment elsewhere. We give them the first workplace experience and we, we you know we hire on local operators in the community and, and they'll be our smart ice champions as we operate as a social enterprise it it makes sense for inuit society because social enterprise really matches inuit society societal values of protecting the environment working together it's the respect it's the coming to the table being very humble with a beginner's mind to to ask the questions to learn um, to learn. We're being made by Inuit, for Inuit. I, I really do believe that we try to bridge the gap between traditional knowledge and modern technology. With climate change happening the way it is, more and more technologies like us are going to be needed. I just want to see many smart ice operations pop up in other communities knowing that, the, that those are people in those communities doing stuff to help keep their community members safe. Social enterprise by community, for community. Find out more at bisocialcanada.com. So I wanted to just follow up um, on that short video by telling you a little bit about um, a short report that we commissioned, Smart Eyes commissioned last year from a local consultant social research development corporation here in Canada to ask Inuit in Inuit organizations, Inuit stakeholders and right holders in Northern Canada, what does it take for a social enterprise to be successful and sustainable? And one, so I'm just going to go through those four main overarching themes that they, the feedback that they gave us. And one was really to integrate and align with other initiatives and existing projects in the community. It's really important that um, uh, we sort of attract new investments, build new capacity, uh, use local supply chains in communities, and therefore coordinating and integrating with whatever is going on in the community instead of duplicating it is really important. The second point was about engaging community members uh, in decision making, and this has got a lot to do with uh, supporting Inuit self-determination and reconciliation in their own homeland. And the goal here is building local capacity and giving supporting community ownership and control ultimately of those those business enterprises. It is the goal of Smart Eyes that will it will ultimately be operated and managed by Inuit in their own communities. A third overarching theme was about uh, really important about uh, employment but not employment for its own sake in communities. It's really about, and so that what I mean by that is not about just counting jobs as an outcome. It's really important that social enterprises, uh, first of all, provide opportunities for people to stay in their communities, but secondly, that we provide them with meaningful jobs and ones that are meaningful to their community and their culture, which is really important. It comes back to those Inuit societal values. And another overarching theme was um, developing that in-house capacity to train staff. Uh, so we in Smart Eyes call it training the trainers, where we're training Inuit to be the trainers of, of our Inuit operators. And what that does is make sure that uh, Inuit uh, ways of knowing and learning are built into the training and it's culturally contextualized and it's holistic. So just in summary, uh, the takeaways I'd like you to have for social enterprise is, you know, the fact that it addresses community priorities, in our case, adopting Inuit societal values and promoting Inuit self-determination. 
it's empowering community solutions, especially in our case where we're looking at climate change impacts on safe sea ice travel. It's integrating technology and Inuit knowledge. It's uh, culturally contextualized training and really about social innovation for well-being. Smart Ice, as you saw in the video, has opened the first ever Northern Technology Production Center in Inuit Nunangat for training young Inuit to build and distribute our, our uh, sensors. So thank you for listening to me. I'll be happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor. What an interesting and fascinating project and also approach. I'm sure there will be lots of questions to you afterwards. Um, as I said before, we will save all the questions for after the presentations and then we'll get to address them in a plenary discussion at the end. So now we move on from Canada across to Greenland and more specifically, we move to the municipality Komune Karfik Semersog. Semersog. <laughs> I've been practicing, I probably still got it. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds about right. So oh, thank okay. you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's a, but I know it's the place of much ice apparently and geographically the world's largest municipality. So exactly. I'd like, to, I'd like to introduce our next speaker here, Emil Shervedal, head of business department within the municipality. Um, Emil has a background in innovation, knowledge and entrepreneurial dynamics from Aalborg University. And he will tell us a bit about his experiences and also the local government strategies for fostering business development in small communities. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Emil. Please take the stage. Doris, thank you very much for this okay, kind presentation. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure being here and being able to talk to you about how we're fostering business uh, development. As I uh, mentioned, as mentioned, I'm the head of uh, Samosok Business, which is uh, the business department within the municipality of uh, Samosok. And our goal is to promote and stimulate the business development, investments, and entrepreneurship in the world's uh, largest uh, municipality. And being the largest municipality means that we're covering both uh, urban and rural areas. We have a settlement spread along the coastline from east to west, um, and we also have the, the we're, we're also the capital city. So, one of the things that we have found that is very important when we're fostering business development is having an action plan. And I think it sounds very simple. Um, but we have actually found that it's uh, working, and by creating uh, our first capital strategy for Nuke, we have actually given our businesses and investors goals and a vision to strive for. One of the goals is to become 30,000 inhabitants by 2030. Currently, we're at 18,000, but we're on the rise, so it's working. And I would say one of the motivating factors for the strategy was that we have showed that we're willing to set up some very ambition goals. And it's an urban uh, growth strategy in an Arctic context. And that has gained us a lot of international um, attention. Um, and by setting this high standards and an ambitious uh, direction, we have seen that our businesses has been willing to follow. Um, an additional goal for the strategy was to unite the city's uh, different stakeholders. So we had a lot of public uh, participation in creating the strategy. So we have a nice dialogue with citizens, various associations, institutions, and companies. And one of our finest tasks at Samasok Business is to facilitate these partnerships uh, and net networks between various stakeholders and, uh, and sectors across sectors. So I would have to say it sounds simple, but uh, planning and partnerships has been one of the key elements in our strategy and has been one of the main contributing factors to the success that we're experiencing right now. But we're very big. Um, municipality shown here on the map on your right and local knowledge and local commitments are very important when we're fostering business development. Uh, 
we uh, have a municipality which is geographically around the size of France, but we only have 23,000 inhabitants. And the conditions for uh, doing business, it varies a lot between the various cities and settlements. Um, um, and to ensure that we have the necessary knowledge to create the optimal conditions in all parts of a municipality, we have uh, funded uh, three business councils. We have one in Nuuk, one in Bamut, and one that covers uh, East Greenland. These uh, councils, they function as uh, advisory uh, forums for the municipality, and they have a very great influence on the political agenda. And uh, they bring together all stakeholders uh, locally from uh, the business community, various organizations, also the political parties are represented, and obviously a lot of uh, public institutions. Uh, and aside from being an advisor form, the council also function as uh, advisors for entrepreneurs and investors who wants to do business in, in that uh, specific geographical uh, area. And I think that by bringing together these uh, different stakeholders, we have really created a very strong foundation for fostering successful local partnerships. And I think also another important point is that we're able to base our project and, and our efforts at Samosok Business on the local demands. Uh, and maybe, and, and it's very important because maybe we, we're only able to travel, maybe I'll visit the, 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 the cities in our municipality once or twice a year. So it's, uh, it's very uh, important to have this local ownership. Um, Another aspect in our capital strategy and in the municipality is that uh, the sources for our development are both uh, international and local. So in terms of uh, our development, we have to be uh, both uh, locally, nationally and internationally oriented. And that's why uh, that's because we're a very small uh, capital. We're only around 18,000 inhabitants in Nuuk, <clears throat> and we're in a very small uh, economy. So we have no choice but to orient ourselves towards the world, especially when it comes to attracting investors. Um, <clears throat> and when it comes to attracting investors, I would have to send a small token of gratitude to uh, US President, Mr. Donald Trump, who offered to buy Greenland. And I would have to say that really sparked a lot of uh, attention. Um, actually, Visit Greenland's website crashed just when he announced his plans. So that has really given us a lot of uh, opportunities. And I think, although he might disagree that Greenland has a lot more to offer, um, I think he, he, he's mainly interested in the geographical location and the minerals, but we have a lot more to offer. So. We're a fairly young investment market, and I think that people often perceive like investing in the Arctic as something uh, unique and, and a bit exotic. And I don't necessarily share that uh, perception. I think that uh, investing in the Arctic share a lot more similarities than differences with everywhere else in the world. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's about a reasonable rate of return, security, and stable framework uh, conditions. And by those measures, I think that investing in Greenland is very attractive. Um, just to showcase a couple of um, the opportunities that we have, I'd like to show you a small video. This is Nook. It is the largest city in Greenland and the economic and cultural center of the country. In 2030, the city will be home to about 30,000 people. The city is expanding rapidly and has already planned new residential areas for over 4,000 new housings. Positioned between the American, European and Asian markets through the Northwest Passage, Nook could become a shortcut to these markets. And with the expansion of the airport in 2023, 
the city will welcome business partners and tourists from all over the world. Along with the completed expansion of the harbor in Nook, the stage is set for Nook to solidify its position as the business hub of Greenland. Through an ambitious business strategy, establishing or expanding in Nook has never been easier. Both domestic and international companies within fishing, mineral extraction, logistics, construction, tourism, and retail are given great opportunities. With three square kilometers of industrial areas close to both aeronautical and maritime logistics, as well as a buzzing cultural life, opportunities are aplenty. Nook is on the rise and the population is growing. In an effort to provide housing for all the future people of Nook, the construction of a completely new city district has begun. The project is the biggest housing project in Greenlandic history. It will be completed in 2030, and along with many other projects, it's open to investors. As you see, we're quite busy here in Nook. However, we're always interested in engaging in new meaningful business relationships. So, we look forward to welcoming you in Nook. So, thank you very much. I think that's um, my introduction. Great, thank you very much, Emil. I think this gives us a, a really good idea of what it's like to be working in such a vast and sparsely populated municipality. Um, to our audience, please remember you can send specific questions to Emil or any of the panelists in the chat or by email. And meanwhile, um, we move on to our next speaker and we kind of stay in touch here with Greenland. Next up is Christian Wintergaard, who is the CEO of the Danish Foundation for Entrepreneurship. And prior to this, he was also the Managing Director for the Øresund Entrepreneurship Academy. Christian has got a PhD from Copenhagen Business School, specializes in uh, venture capital and entrepreneurship. And he also has international teaching experience and often acts as an advisor entrepreneurs, the business community and policy makers. Yeah. Today he will talk to us a bit about his perspectives on the possibilities and challenges for entrepreneurs in Greenland. Welcome Christian, it's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be, uh, I don't know, to say with you or at least uh, be present here at this, uh, at this conference. I'm pleased to be have the invitation just to give you guys a little bit of an insight to what we do and where we come from. The Danish Foundation for Entrepreneurship, we help to ensure that entrepreneurship capabilities and competences is an elementary element of the schools and universities, et cetera. So entrepreneurship competences is something that is deeply embedded within the students and pupils across all age groups. So that's kind of our primary target as a, um, SFA Foundation, uh, we work to have entrepreneurship education embedded uh, from, we usually say from APC to PhD, uh, so across the whole age group of students. In 2017, uh, we conducted a large uh, study done uh, within the Nordic and Arctic. Uh, we created a report called the Nordic Entrepreneurship Islands Project, where we mapped out the amount of entrepreneurship education happening across all different kinds of islands, among here also Greenland, uh, that dealt with how much entrepreneurship education was actually taking place. Uh, so for you, those of you who had an interest, this report is still for downloads. Uh, but, the, but the report also, on our way to conduct this report, we also passed by uh, Greenland, and we, we struck a relationship with the Greenlandish government um, and we talked to them about the kind of work that we've been doing in Denmark, but also in the Ferry Islands regarding uh, how do we implement entrepreneurship education across different age groups. Um, and also the kind of successes we'd had with young people starting up companies and how this has also changed the entrepreneurship culture in the society in Denmark, and but also in the Ferry Islands. And, and we struck such a good relationship with the government, but also with the private sector uh, people, uh, private partners and sponsors that we, in 2018, opened up an office in, in Greenland, uh, a, a, a subsidy of the Danish Foundation in order to make sure that also the kinds of teaching materials, the kinds of teaching programs for students, the kinds of competitions, uh, the different kinds of programs that we, that we, we have had to, uh, implemented in Danish ground also got to be an asset for 
for Greenlandish uh, students. Uh, so of today, we have a, a board of directors uh, and a board of executives uh, that is um, the governing board of this organization in, in Greenland. And we have been working for the past uh, two and a half years uh, to do a lot of teacher training, uh, a, lot, a lot of program the development, a lot of transition of programs uh, to, to, to the Greenland and Nordic uh, uh, languages. And uh, in, in many different kinds of ways, trying to alter our Danish programs to be fitted for a Greenlandic uh, society and for Greenlandic students and, and their teachers. We have actually been teaching quite a few teachers. That's kind of the key to our success is that teachers and professors, uh, educators in general uh, in the society is able to carry out and and teach entrepreneurship education because unless they are experts or feel like experts, uh, they will not be able to carry those kinds of teaching programs out in the classrooms. And they're not able to do that either in collaboration with business partners unless they have a certain kind of feel and competence uh, for it themselves. But we have been, I would say, highly successful. Uh, of course, the COVID also uh, troubles our our uh, our our maneuverability to get around to the different kinds of uh, cities and the, and, and the countrysides uh, where, where the teachers are located. Uh, so we have also been in a digital transition for the past yeah, almost year now in order to get our programs across to teachers who are highly occupied with, with getting by. But we do uh, teacher programs for, for, for professors, etc. It's all for free. Um, and it's, uh, we also do uh, when when students have been through our programs and been through the teaching activities, we are also able to to provide some uh, student startup grants uh, for the students to start up companies. Uh, our experience from Greenland right now is that we are in the beginning of a, a tr transition, so we haven't yet seen so many students who start up companies uh, based on the programs yet, but I I know from experiences, uh, primarily in Denmark, is that it takes a little bit of time to implement it as part of the culture in a school and in a university before those ideas really get to spark. Uh, but but we do have the capabilities to also provide grants if students uh, one day who wants to start up companies um, and and make a transition based on on their their own ideas. So that's kind of a little bit of an insight to what we do in Greenland at the moment. And, and, and we, as I said before, have a strong relationship with uh, the Danish, uh, the, the, the government of Greenland, but also with a lot of uh, private uh, partners. Great. Thank you very much, Christian. A lot of interesting ideas and, and important points that you actually mentioned here as well. Um, in relation to the training aspect and the education aspect, and I hope you can continue the conversation with Emil afterwards, so you can probably learn a little bit from each other here. Um, it's now a great pleasure to introduce the final speaker for this session. It's Tor Erik Zombi, a young startup entrepreneur. And he will speak to us from the small community of uh, Kautokeino in Finnmark in northern Norway. Tor Erik is the co-founder of the company Tundra Drone, and this company specializes in innovative lighting solutions for drones in the high north. And he has a background in marketing and has previously worked for the Norwegian Seafood Council, amongst other things. He's also a member of the local Sami community, and he will talk to us about global possibilities for startups in the north. Tor Erik, welcome. Thank you for the great introduction, and thank you everyone for watching here. I'm Tor Erik Zombi from the Norwegian startup Tundra Drone. Our vision is to give superpowers to the drone pilot. And we do that by making pioneering drone equipment that are developed and tested here in the Arctic Tundra. We believe if the products work here, they will work everywhere in the world because we have really bad weather conditions here. So that is a really quality stamp. To give you an idea of how big a drone is, this is the most sold consumer drone. So it's not too big and you can clap it together. So it's used worldwide. We live in the Arctic tundra in north of Norway, in Kautokeino, which is located above 
in the red dot, as you can see in the map here. The team in Tundra Drone consists of uh, co-founder Tim Valio. He has a master's degree in electronics engineering and is our product developer. And me, Tor Eric Zombie, I have a master's degree in marketing as as you mentioned, uh, experience in international marketing for the Norwegian Seafood Council. And also I have studied design thinking at Stanford University. And as a team, we are the dream team because we combine technology with market competence. We also have a lot of good helpers with us that have provided us with grants and also advisors. And we also plan to build a team with product developers, sales and marketing. Uh, our products now, the first products, product we are making is the auto moving light. It's a bright drone lighting that helps you to see in the dark. So it works like uh, the headlights for a car. So when you drive to the left, the lighting will turn to the left. Similar way, uh, the drone camera will move. So when it, it's pointing downwards, the lighting will follow. And this is the first solution for these types of drones. And this creates new applications for these types of drones. It's used for finding missing people by public safety and first, first responders. And uh, it is used for inspection by power line inspection, by bridge inspections and also construction sites. The second product is actually our first product, which we have a little on hold, but is, it is a drone siren and it is used to move reindeer with a drone with a powerful siren sound and soon with barking sounds but we also see this as a global potential in the sheep market and cattle market so when we make the drone siren work here in Kautokeino it will for sure work around the globe in Australia in Canada and wherever and our mission is to create pioneering drone equipment that create new applications for drones so for instance, the lighting makes it possible to do the drone job in the dark. The drone siren makes it possible to move animals with a sound. So stay tuned for more exciting equipment. There is a global market opportunities for drones. In 2024, there is expected to be 15 million drones worldwide. And the drone market is growing rapidly in all parts of the world. America, Europe, Asia, and all, of, all the other parts of the world as well, including Africa. So my point here is to tell you that we have just as good conditions for success from the Arctic tundra as elsewhere, like in the bigger cities, given it will be in Oslo or San Francisco, because the key success factors is that we have internet and we have electricity. And with these two important factors, we have access to e-commerce and we can reach consumers from all over the world. So imagine you are in New York in Times Square and you are looking at, uh, do you know where the best place to place an ad is? Which building or where? No, actually it's on your phone because people are walking on Times Square. So if you can be found here, you can be found everywhere, even in New York. So we also use DHL Express as a competitive advantage and we can ship products from here to almost everywhere in the world and they can receive it the next day. And we can also receive parts from other parts of the world to Kyoto Kano shortly. Sometimes it goes faster to get something internationally than from Oslo. And the technology is uh, becoming so advanced now. So we can make use 3D printing to make plastic parts here in Kyoto Kano for rapid prototyping. We can use CNC milling to make aluminum parts and we can use PCB printing to make electronic cards that we put inside the, our products. And in the future, we will also apply rob robotized product assembly. So not using humans, but we can use uh, robots to do the tasks. And these solutions are becoming more affordable that even startups like us can invest in them. And of course, this is possible because our team has solid competence and expertise 
within our fields, within product development, sales and marketing. But also we have um, good partners and uh, suppliers that help us to succeed. Uh, and our main competitive advantage is our location because our products are developed and tested here in the Norwegian Arctic tundra. So you can copy everything, but you cannot copy our origin and that it's tested here. And that's the story we're gonna tell to succeed in the world. Thank you. You can contact me here if you want, visit tundradrone.com. Thank you very much, Tor Erik. This is really a great example, I think, of an Arctic-specific innovation that is possible even within a very geographically isolated area. And you actually mentioned that the location is a kind of your competitive advantage. Um, yeah, we have some time left now for questions. And while I'm going to compile questions from the Q&A session, I might actually follow up with you, Tor Erik, um, what you said. Um, I was thinking, you know, with the current Corona crisis and, you know, the coming and going of lockdowns and social distancing and online conferences and meetings, uh, what do you expect will be the implications for your business or for the business community in your area from the current pandemic? And what needs to be done to make sure that remote communities like yours are not further left behind when it comes to recovery strategies and so on? Yeah, thank you. I don't know how to tackle that question, but uh, I think um, it's something good always comes out of something bad. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, it's really sad that we have the corona, but um, like it's actually now more luxurious to live in the small towns because we don't need to worry about this. We, we don't have corona here, thankfully. But also it, it's easier for us to actually have meetings because people are now more open to have um, online meetings and we don't actually need to travel because we use half the day or at least one day to travel somewhere. So we actually save time. And um, uh, the corona actually, uh, there was a di digital trend already before corona that uh, e-commerce was um, going upwards, but when the virus hit us, this just boosted that the trend, the mega trend just got a boost. And so we can see that e-commerce has uh, really picked up, but it has also have an, had an impact on tourism here, of course, uh, because uh, travel is, uh, and the traveling here is the biggest driver for income so you need to have traffic so that's the bad part here that uh, the tourism industry is struggling great thank you i think i will pass on this question to trevor in canada how do you see the impacts of the current pandemic for remote communities and do you think it's kind of directing attention away from some of the more pressing issues that existed before the pandemic like climate change for example well, to follow up a little bit on what Tor was saying, for Smart Ice, or for Smart Ice, um, the pandemic has not impacted our activities whatsoever, because we put into the hands of these isolated remote communities the tools they need to travel safely on the ice. They they don't need people traveling from the south to them, and it's also a time. Uh, because of the pandemic, when supply chains were broken and food insecurity was heightened in these communities, there was greater demand for people to travel on the sea ice. And so there was a greater demand for the use of smart ice services to keep them safe, especially in the springtime. So we actually saw an increase in activity and the federal government in Canada here supported our increased activity in the communities and to expand to new communities to help them in adapting to the pandemic. Okay, thank you. I got one uh, follow-up question for you as well from the from the audience. How often do you receive feedback from the indigenous communities about Smart Eyes service and are you able to adapt and evolve the service according to local needs? Yes, in, in, in each community we have a community management committee. It's part of that Inuit self-determination, so the local community manages Smart Ice. And so they give us 
they're the ones who tell the operators when to go out, where to go out, and they give us feedback on maybe new types of technology that we could uh, to manufacture to help them in adapting to these unpredictable sea ice conditions. They'll, they also have asked us to document their traditional knowledge of safe ice travel. As you know, for centuries and centuries, Inuit have relied on traditional knowledge passed on from generation to generation orally. They've never written them down. But now because of uh, changing uh, ice conditions, because of the legacy of colonialism in Northern Canada, there's a greater need to have this information in the hands of younger generations and less experienced ice users. And so they have um, asked us to, to document for the first time this knowledge in the form of posters, in the form of handbooks and digital knowledge to help a young Inuit travel on the ice safer. But the other thing is it also helps them to reclaim and teach their culture and values to the next generation because this knowledge isn't just about uh, different ice types and different advice. It obviously, it includes that, but it also includes their language revitalization. It includes um, um, expectations and values in the community. It's part of their culture. Great. So it's really more about the societal values, not just the business or private or economic benefits. That's good to know. Oh, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. um, there is one question for Emil, maybe. Uh, to what extent does Greenland look to China, America, Russia or the EU respectively for investment? Is there a dependency on external investment? There's a dependency on uh, on foreign investments, especially when it uh, comes to the larger infrastructure projects. Um, I think that um, in general, um, Greenland is, Greenland is uh, is open to to investors, uh, no matter if they're American, Chinese. Uh, I think that. Um, uh, the U.S. has really stepped up their efforts here and have recently established, established a consulate, which will probably strengthen the ties between uh, between the U.S. and, and Greenland. Um, yeah. So we're, we're open for business in general. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also uh, Chinese investors here, especially within mining uh, and especially within rare uh, earth uh, minerals. Okay. I thought it was interesting when in your presentation, Emil, you mentioned uh, Greenland has a lot more to offer than just minerals. And so then I was wondering, where do you see, or maybe this question is also relevant to Christian, where do you see the most uh, potential or untapped opportunities in what sort of industries outside of the traditional resource sector? Because we often hear the Arctic is this great resource periphery, but we often also want to develop new industries and new innovation in other sectors. So what are the most, the, the, the key industries that offer the most potential in your opinion? I think we recently did a, a survey on on uh, on this, and uh, what we found is uh, we're we're currently establishing a new international airport here in Nuuk, one in Iloilisat, um, and this will uh, really be a game changer in terms of uh, tourism. So it'd be I believe the tourism will will. Uh, will become one of the, the big uh, sources of income in the future. Uh, in Nuuk, we come from a very low level. Um, we have predominantly, we have uh, people from the MICE uh, segment, which meetings and, uh, and conferences. Um, and also food, I think food, we have a lot of uh, the raw materials if we could refine that, um, I think we'll have a, a, a good opportunity to create a, a lot of sources of income. We're trying to uh, promote this uh, development by creating uh, local food labs, which is basically, uh, it's basically industrial kitchens 
that you can use. You can get started with uh, doing your business business just with from from what you can carry in two bags. So um, I think that's a very interesting uh, development. That, that will probably further be enhanced by the tourism industry as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes. I had uh, one question on my list for Christian, because we've heard from Trevor's presentation about this new exciting model of knowledge transfer and, and engagement with indigenous communities. And Christian, you also mentioned that you kind of had to adapt your Danish programs to the Greenlandic local context and circumstances a little bit now. So I was wondering what recommendations do you have for the higher education sector or the, the, the secondary tertiary education sector? Do we need to rethink or adapt our ways in which we engage with remote communities in the Arctic? How do we promote this knowledge transfer a little bit more to, to make those links between, you know, people who live out there or out here and the knowledge providers who live over there in the big cities usually? Well, it's a kind of a diverse uh, question, uh, but I, I guess um, in the beginning when we started to operate in Greenland and started to work, work there, we were uncertain about what the culture would be among teachers and professors, etc. Would they be very different from what we usually engage with? Uh, and our experience was that there wasn't really a huge difference. They liked their kids uh, as much as any other teacher would do, and they are just as professional as many other teachers would be. And they're just as eager to make the students uh, engage with entrepreneurial projects as any other teacher would be. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but of course, there was a, a lack of skills within entrepreneurship and within innovation. It was not a topic that was taught very broadly. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was a huge uh, obligation for us to engage. So I think the biggest transition has actually been that the Greenland is very scattered so you have to travel quite a bit to get to the different places. And, and of course, there's a language barrier. Uh, so it would not be all uh, teachers that would be able to understand Danish. Some would, would be more comfortable with understanding the land. So it was more of a, it was more of a trans, translation or, uh, oblig or, or problematic uh, that we would engage with than the cultural part, I would say, um, which is, makes it much easier for us, of course. Uh, and also, when we look at the teach the students, they would be just as any other kid we would know of from any other place in the world. So I don't think there was too much of a difference there. I do think, however, that if if um, and, and that would probably also go to Emil uh, that I think one of the transitions that Greenland is in the moment is from going what industries would would we live out of in Greenland in the future? And of course, it's been dominated by the fishing industry and the minerals and and things you could carve out and things you can pick out of the sea. And I think in order to become a company, I have more companies like Tours. I think that there was also a, 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 an educational uh, obligation that needs to be uh, greater fulfilled. Because before you, can, before you can grow technology companies, then you have to company with technology skills. Uh, and before you have somebody with technology skills, you need to teach those skills. Uh, unless uh, people move to Greenland and, and bring those skills with them. So I think... In order to, to make a transition in Greenland economically in the portfolio of companies and, and make more growth-oriented companies, I think there is some, 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 uh, some, some digital and technology skills that need to be taught also. Fair enough. Yes, thank you very much. Another question I have here on my list. How easy or difficult is it for locals to start up a small business? What about red tape, regulations, funding, qualifications? So the, the whole uh, business environment, basically. So what sort of support mechanisms exist in your area? And um, maybe I will direct this question to Tor Erik first, because he speaks as a private entrepreneur. How easy is it in your area to set up a business? And what sort of uh, support would you maybe expect? Um, I think um, in Norway, we are lucky to have a very good um, uh, governmental grants. We have Innovation Norway with market clarification to find out if your idea is worth pursuing or not, which we did and found out that this was a good idea. So we got further with uh, commercialization grants from Innovation Norway and, and 
So that really helps to kind of start start with the, your innovation grant and also use your local municipality. And we also have the Sami parliament. And um, yeah, and there are investors even here in north of Norway. So you just have to find them. This is the best advice to to uh, entrepreneurs. You need to make a pitch, just a short one. You, you have to remember it for 30 seconds, for one minute, and just a quick presentation like I did. But just tell your story and talk about the problem and the solution you are solving. Because uh, it's not about your product, it's what it does. So we are really user driven. So if there is no market and people don't want it, then it's not, you're not going to get grants either. So you have to kind of do check out on both sides. But use Talk all the good helpers you have. That is my best advice. Don't do everything yourself. Choose your battles. <laughs> good point. I'll probably round off this question and maybe I can pass it on one last time to Trevor because the indigenous context is so different in northern Canada to, for example, northern Norway. What are the sort of support mechanisms that are required for indigenous business development in your area? Well, I think there are grants available both from the regional and Inuit governments for Inuit owned businesses. But also there, there are supports from industry and also governments to support new ideas, especially with respect to climate change adaptation. Um, when you have the surface of the ocean frozen for six, nine, six to nine months of the year, and most of the tourism industry and most of the community fisheries is carried out from a nice platform, then with climate change and declining ice conditions, it's imperative for safety, profitability, confidence in those industries that they know how to, to travel safely on the ice. So we work with both outfitting industries, tourism industries, fisheries, uh, to to help them uh, retain their profitability even as climate is intensifying and sea ice is becoming more dangerous to travel on. We also have in the opposite way where with the opening up of the Arctic and increased shipping and increased interest in mining and shipping ore out of these coastal mines that uh, there's a potential conflict between communities and shipping um, because communities want to travel on the ice shipping wants to obviously break ice where that overlaps with their shipping season. So we find ourselves with the ability to maybe help avoid and, and manage those conflicts. Great. Thank you very much. With this, I think we have reached the end of our assigned um, uh, panel time. I think the time is up. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our four speakers for their presentations and your very insightful and interesting comments. I hope audience at home, you have all enjoyed this session. Apologies, please, if we didn't get to the time to address all of your questions. But as I said, please feel free to contact the panelists afterwards if you would like to follow up any more detailed questions and any of the points that we discussed today. And as I said, you can do this uh, via the Slack space that has been set up for the symposium. Thank you again for joining us today. Stay safe wherever you are. And of course, all the best for Christmas and the new year. Take care.